Hello, welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Dayton, Texas. I'm Guy Williams. I'm glad you're here with us today. You can participate more fully in our worship service by downloading our worship guide and our hymn sheet. They are provided at links attached to this video in the post below. Also, you can share prayer requests with us. We would love to be in prayer with you. There is a form for that in the link that's shared below. Please click on that and let us know how we may join you in prayer. And finally, if you would like to contribute to the ministries of our church through your giving, um, please click the link below for our secure online giving service and you can support our ministry in that way. Now let's begin our time of worship together. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Better is one day in your courts, O Lord, than a thousand elsewhere, for you are our sun and shield. Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Please join me in the opening prayer. Almighty God, all creation is your handiwork and displays your majesty. Give us clean hands and pure hearts, and keep us from trusting in the false gods of the world. Bless us and make us a blessing to all in your name. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Our hymn is Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty.
As we come to a time of prayer as a community of faith, let us begin in silence. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, we give you thanks for your faithfulness, for your love, for your steadfastness. Lord, our hearts are heavy this week for our nation. Lord, we pray for the family of George Floyd. We grieve with them and we pray, O oh Lord, that you would comfort them. Lord, we lament the lasting and lingering impact of racism. We pray for peaceful demonstrations to overshadow riots. We pray for those doing good public work of law enforcement. And we pray for the bad actors and faulty systems that you would break people's hearts and that you would prevent harm. Lord, in all these things, we remember your instruction to us. Blessed are the peacemakers. It is hard work making peace. Lord, we pray that you would give us um, a heart for the peace that you long to bring. Lord, we pray that you would give us a heart for the justice that you want to see in the world and in our culture and our society. And Lord, we pray that you would set us about that task of being peacemakers for the glory of Christ. Lord, we lift up these in all our prayers in the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, and we pray together as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is number 622, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood.
please join me in the affirmation of faith. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture lesson this week comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. 
This is the beginning of a summer series on Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Today we'll begin with chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Hear the word of God for you this day. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me? O Lord, we give you thanks for your word made flesh in your son, Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks for your word in the scriptures through which you reveal yourself to us. And we pray in these moments together that you would speak your word, that you would write your word upon our hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit at work within us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What sort of story are we in? That's what the two hobbits talk about, Sam and Frodo, when they're on the verge of entering Mordor Castle to dispose of the ring of power. Sam is there assisting Frodo, who's been, um, I guess, drafted for this task, and they're about to face their most difficult challenge yet of everything that they've gone through so far. And Sam wants to know from Frodo, I wonder what sort of story we are in. Now by that he means, are we in a happy ending story? or a sad ending story? In other words, does what the future hold mean that we should enter into this with hope, or does what the future hold mean that we would, should feel despair? Will we have victory or will we have defeat? What kind of story we're in and what kind of story we understand ourselves to be in makes a tremendous difference in how we live. What sort of story are we in? We all live according to what sort of story we believe that we are in. There were stories among Paul's day and in his culture that all of our worth and our purpose as human beings was tied up in money and wealth and possessions, in sex, in power, and in status. Boy, does this sound like any culture that we might know of. Of course it does. It's a lot like our culture in that respect. Our culture tells us the story that we are worth what we have, what we make, that our culture tells us um, that what we are worth is what our life looks like, how attractive we are, how attractive our experiences and adventures look to other people that we are worth what we do and our accomplishments. There's all sorts of stories that people live by. 
that tell them what they're worth, if they're worth anything, what the purpose and meaning of their life is about. What sort of story are we in? Paul begins the letter to the Ephesians by this long passage of praise to God. And in that passage of praise, he recounts essentially what God's story is, what God is doing through his people throughout time and how that story is bringing in new people to it. People who are included in Christ when they believed after hearing the truth of the gospel. In other words, Paul is saying that you and I, along with the Ephesian church, that we are included in the sacred story of God. Paul is writing with the people in Ephesus who, um, a church that was made up of both Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, people who uh, traced their place in the family of God and the people of God back hundreds or, or even a thousand years. And he's got people in that church who are not Jewish by birth, have no history with Israel, but who have come to believe that Jesus is one who was sent from God, that he was the promised Messiah of the Jewish people, and that he is inviting even the Gentiles, even those outside of um, Israel, into a relationship with God through him. And so Paul is saying that all of us have been included in the sacred story of God, and that means some important things for us, for the story that we're living. It means that we are living a story of hope. And there's so much richness to what he says, and it's very, it's very rich and dense, this passage, but I want to highlight several things that it means when we say that we are included in the sacred story of God. That means something about us. It means, uh, for one thing, that we have been called to a special um, purpose, that we've been called and chosen for a special purpose in Christ. He says it early on in verse 4, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Now, why is that and what does that mean? Well, he, that one thing that means is that we are saved by God's grace for our benefit, but also for God's glory and his purposes that we were chosen by him in, in our salvation to be holy, that is to be set apart. We think of the word holy as being a religious term. We think of it as something that's either morally out of reach, we're already disqualified, and we have this awful habit that continues to linger with us of falling short of what God wants for us, or we think of it as something negative, like um, someone who is holier than thou, who just has an kind of uppity feel about themselves and we don't enjoy being around them and we don't respect them. So it's either something that we don't want anything to be, you know, don't want to have anything to do with, or it's something that is way out of reach for us. And those two things distract us from what it really means in a biblical sense. That what it means at its root, at the root of the concept, is that it is set apart for special use. Now that affects our behavior, our choices, what we do, but at root, what it means is that we are set apart for a special purpose. And I like to think of it this way. When I was growing up, we went to my grandmother's house. She lived one block down from us, and we would go down there for, for, dinner, on, uh, for you know, dinner on Sundays after church. And on Thanksgiving and Christmas and Easter, we would go over as well. And we ate from different dishes on a normal Sunday than we ate uh, off of on a Thanksgiving, a Christmas, or an Easter. We do the same still when my family goes down to my parents' house, and if it's a normal weekend and we've just gone down for a visit, we might eat off of anything, paper plates or something that's in the cabinet, but for special occasions, for Thanksgiving, for Easter, for Christmas, for those kinds of times, it takes a lot longer to set the table. We have special things that we get out. We have special serving dishes. We have special glasses. We have special plates and we have special utensils. Everything is different. It's all stuff that has been set aside and held back for a special use. It is holy. It's set apart for a special use. And that's a description of you and I. 
Not people who walk around with a moral superiority, but people whose behavior and our choices are shaped by living in such a way that we are different and set apart and noticeably for a special use that we might reflect the person, the character, or the love of God in Jesus Christ by the things that we say and the things that we do and how we live. We're set apart for a special use. We have a, a um, we're, we are given a special purpose as part of being included in the sacred story of God. We're also elevated to a special position. Not that we think of ourselves as being above others. Uh, we're filled with humility in Christ, or at least God is working that way for us. But what Paul says next is that we are given an elevated position and it's speaking to the worth that we have in God's eyes in Jesus Christ. That when our identity is in Christ and not in other things, not in the stories of the world about what we're worth or whose we are or what, where we get the meaning we have for our life, but when we find that in Christ, that we are adopted to sonship, he says. We are adopted to sonship. Now, there was one Greek term for that, that meant that phrase, and it was a legal designation that meant that an adopted son was uh, on the same level as a biological son in terms of being an heir in the father's household. And that image is what God has, uh, that Paul uses uh, to say what our position is in the family of God. That it doesn't matter if we arrived earlier or late, when we put our faith in Christ, when we believed in him and were included in the family of God, included in the sacred story of God, that we were elevated to be adopted co-heirs with Christ as children of God. You can't get any higher in the family of God than that. That our worth comes from being a child of God and a full heir of all the blessings of God and of heaven and of a place in God's family. We are elevated to a special position. We are adopted to sonship. That is, we are made heirs as children of God. When we are included in the sacred story of God, we're given a special purpose. We're elevated to a special position. And finally, Paul says that we are privy to God's plan in the big picture of things. That he is bringing to unity all things in heaven and earth under Christ. That everything he has created, the earth and the heavens, that he's bringing them all to unity under Christ. Now, for the Israelites, for the Jewish Christians in the crowd as they were reading this, um, this letter of Paul's, this would remind them of heaven and earth overlapping. And that would have them thinking about the stories of the temple because even though they knew that God's presence was everywhere throughout creation and that, um, that nothing built by human hands could contain God, they also knew that God had made a promise and that God had blessed the temple with his presence so that the people of God might know that the presence of God was with them in a, in a real and powerful way. And so they saw the temple as where heaven and earth overlapped because the earth is Lord's and everything in it, but the earth is also a realm where God's kingdom and God's will are not fully done. We know that too well. But the heavens, if we think about it this way, heavens are not something up there in the sky, out in space somewhere. Heaven is the realm where God's will and reign are perfectly carried out. That as Jesus prayed, in fact, in the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that he taught us, that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is done in heaven. So heaven is where his kingdom comes in its fullness and where his will is done completely. And heaven and earth overlapped in the temple because that was where people came and where they made themselves right with God. Every, they, everything was right with God because of their worship and their sacrifices. When they came to the temple, everything got right with God again. The temple was where heaven and earth overlapped. And in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, heaven and earth overlapped again. 
that Jesus was God and wherever Jesus went, heaven was there so that heaven was overlapping earth in the place and among the people where Jesus was present, was teaching, was healing, was performing miracles, was loving, was gracing. Heaven and earth overlapped. The image I have of this is a solar eclipse where the moon moves into position in such a way that it fully creates a shadow where it, it blocks fully and a shadow is formed with, on the earth where the moon is blocking the sun. When we or find a way to safely view it, it, we can see that the moon there, we can see that circle and we can see just that rim of light on the outside. For me, that's a picture because it, see, it shows us that something is fully overlapped. And this is what God is doing, and that is his ultimate will in Christ. This is his plan for redeeming and restoring our world, is that he would bring into unity all things in heaven and in earth under Christ. Under Christ. And you and I are included in that because when we are saved, when we are become believers in Christ, we put our trust in his grace, his Holy Spirit begins to work in us. He starts to work in our lives to root out the ways that we are in opposed to the will and the kingdom of God reigning in our lives. And we become more and more set apart. That is, we become more and more different from the world and more like him. But because we're in the world, heaven starts to overlap through our lives. And God's prayer in Jesus Christ that the kingdom would come and the will would be done on earth as it is in heaven begins to happen. This is kind of an amazing thought. Now, there's one other thing that Paul says I want to speak to, and he, he says this as a way of describing who God is. He says that God works out everything in conformity with his will with his purpose and with his plan that he works everything out into conformity with his plan this is what i think that means i think it means that um, as we simply observe from looking at the scripture and looking at the world that not everything that happens in this world happens according to the will of god because we sin and people sin against us. We commit injustices and injustices are committed against us that in things that we do and in things that are done to us, things that happen that are outside of the will of God, that are opposed and against to the will of God. So God does not foreordain every thing that happens. However, God does work out and conform everything to the purposes of his will so that the final picture is secure, but the journey there takes some work and some doing. It means that nothing in our life is wasted because God will take it and will redeem it and will graft it into his purposes so that in the end result, it's the beautiful picture that he wants to create. Bob Ross um, had a popular television show in the 80s and 90s, early 90s, uh, throughout the 80s, where he would paint a beautiful landscape scene in only about a half an hour. And thanks to Netflix and other streaming services, we've rediscovered Bob Ross and his paintings of mountains and of uh, clouds. And of course, you know it and I know it. You can say it with me if you want to, happy little trees. Now, the method that he used was called uh, a wet-on-wet -wet oil painting. And what that means is that before the program started, he would uh, get, a paint, he would get his um, canvas together that he would put on a real thin layer of, of white paint so that it was already a little bit wet. And as he went, he would paint, but instead of letting things dry, he would just continue to paint and work with new colors and he would shape what was on there so that it was really dried and in place, but that he, it was always in process. It was a dynamic process. And so he would work on it throughout that half hour program so that by the end, it was where he wanted it to be. It was the picture that he had in mind. Everything was worked out in conformity to the picture that he wanted to produce. But along the way, there were blobs, there were smudges, 
There were smears, not things that he wanted to have show up in the final um, version, but there were things that were there and that um, he would work out and he would use, uh, that he would refine and he would work with so that in the end they conformed to the picture of what he wanted to see happen. Now, our lives are something like that. Lord knows we have smears and imperfections along the way. But God continues to work those out in Jesus Christ. He continues to take the things in our lives that are the um, imperfections. He doesn't give up on them. He works with them and works them out so that they end up grafting into down the road the picture that he wants to create. It's a mystery how God does this, but that's what he does. That's the promise and the hope that we have in Christ is that the things, everything that happens to us doesn't cement a future for us. That doesn't determine where we will end up. What can determine our course, determine if we have a happy ending story or a sad ending story, a story that gives us hope or a story that's a cause for despair. That is determined by the love of God in Jesus Christ and our response of trust and faith. We are living in the sacred story of God. We have been included into that story. And I want to circle back to the purpose that he has given us in Christ because of that story that we are set apart, that we are holy, that we are fully dedicated to him. There's a beautiful, short, little prayer of praise from St. Teresa of Avila, one of the great spiritual masters. And it goes like this, glory, pardon me, praise be to God from whom comes all the good that we speak and think and do. Praise be to God from whom comes all the good that we speak and think and do. That's a handy way to take stock of our lives. Am I fully dedicated to God in the things that I say? Are my words words that reflect his goodness and love, that reflect his truth and his grace? Are my words being placed in God's hands to do what God would want to do in people's lives through them? Speak all the good that uh, God does uh, through what we speak. Through what we think. Are our thoughts and our lives, I mean, our thoughts and our minds, are they um, dedicated to the Lord in such a way that he is shaping our thoughts? Our thoughts determine so much about our lives, what we say and what we do, our outlook on life and our attitude that carries over into so many facets of our life. Are we dedicating our thoughts, our, what we think, to God so that he can shape those to be Christ-like, that we might have the mind of Christ, that we might truly live with hope and grace and peace and love? Are we dedicating our thoughts to God and the things that we do? Are we dedicating our actions and our behaviors to God? Are we living in a way that brings glory and honor and praise to God that points to him because we're dedicated to him? We've been included in this sacred story because we responded in faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We have been given a, a, an incredible position in the family of God of heirs along with Christ and everyone who calls on him. We've been made privy to the plan of God to know that he is working out everything to, to be in unity uh, for in, in the heavens and earth to be in unity in, in Christ Jesus. And we've been given a special purpose. We've been saved for that purpose, to be made holy in him. That is to be made fully dedicated to him, set apart for his special use. And so this week, would you take that inventory? Would you take that inventory of what we speak and what we think and what we do, are they fully dedicated to God so that we can pray with St. Teresa? Praise be to God, from whom comes all the good that we speak and think and do. Would you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your wonderful grace in our lives and for your great calling upon us to be fully dedicated to you, to live in your house as children and as heirs of the King, to give ourselves to the work that you are doing in the world to overlap heaven and earth so that by your grace, all things in the world and in our lives might come under Christ. Lord, I pray that you would help us to take stock with our lives today, that everything we speak and think and do would be praiseworthy and would be good that comes straight from your hands. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If God is working in your life in such a way that you'd like to explore what it means to become a Christian, or if you'd like to go deeper in your walk with Him, we would love to um, help you do that. You can let us know and contact us by um, clicking on the form for next steps and for following up. Um, share with me how to get in contact with you, and I would love to help you out with that. We've got some Bible studies this summer, and I'd love to just communicate with you and share with you about that. Please reach out in that way. We'd love to help you in your faith journey. Our hymn is Come Thou Almighty King. Please sing along. Now receive this blessing and benediction as we close our time of worship together. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his Holy Spirit at work within you. Go in the peace and the power and in the presence of Christ to be his witnesses. Amen. <laughs>